it's one o'clock, so I think uh, we might as well get started. And if people keep coming on, that's just fine. Um, hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and I am so glad to see everybody joining us for this Zoom meeting with Robin Hood. Um, Robin and I have known each other since 1986. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking about that this morning, Wendy. It's like, it's a long time. Yeah, and um, I think, Robin, if I remember correctly, we met uh, at the Sally Swift uh, instructor course in Fort Collins before we went to Joder Ranch in Boulder. That's right. Yep, That's and right. so that was, um, there were, it was two parts, and the second part was just before the advanced training at Joder's, and that was in August? I think so, I think so. So I don't remember what month the first part was. <clears throat> I. I kind of, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure either, but it was pretty close together because it was. Yeah, it was like a month of, or two I, apart. We, I feel like we went from one to the other, but what I remember about doing that course with Sally, because I remember that Sally had really wanted to uh, meet Linda and I'm not, she knew Linda, but she really wanted to have a chance to show Linda what she did. And I was the next best option, you know, since I was her sister. And I tell you what, I had been riding all my life and I felt like I was a complete beginner in terms of just, just some, you know, different concepts and so on. But it was a really great, you know, it was really a great course. And I think that I was thinking about this too, that I think Sally and Linda have had so much influence on so many people in terms of yes. just how this influence and how they went down different paths and that cross over, but they're all the same idea of being, of being positive towards, uh, towards horses and people. Yep. Well, I was with Linda and Sally in February of 1986 right. because Kim Wellness was going to go to Gawler with the Grey Goose. And in February, she was, she was in Washington, Connecticut. I now live in Washington, Virginia, but she, uh, Kim was in Washington, Connecticut. And I went from University of Kentucky, where I was a grad student, up to that clinic. And I took a video camera and I took dots and a tripod. So this is I like going back ages. But anyway, so I went to that clinic and Sally Swift appeared and I was doing tail strokes on a horse's tail and Sally walks up and goes, look, you can see that going all the way down through the horse's spine. Cool. And um, so that's when I met Sally. And, but the other interesting thing is Peggy Cummings was there. And yep. so Peggy rode a horse that I put dots on and had her travel back and forth, does this sound familiar? Travel back and forth on a line while I videoed to go back to grad school. I was gonna get a PhD in, in equine biomechanics and at the time, when I had to analyze the footage, you had to hand digitize every single dot, which meant mm -hmm. that you moved forward a frame and then had to touch the screen on all the dots. And so it's the only course I never completed and I got an F. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> because it was just crazy to hand digitize. And this was 1986. So Apple computers, they had the little tiny cube, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so now, you know, like I went to Hillary Clayton's when we, at uh, MSU when I first came out with Surefoot and we put dots on the horses and stood them on force plates and looked at the kinematics and the computer generated the whole outline of the horse and everything. So, you know, I'm still doing the same thing because what did we do with Bob? Yeah. We had him go back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it was pretty amazing. And I remember I was, I was trying to think of when I first heard of you with the Surefoots because I it was it like seven years ago was it that uh, I started eight years ago so seven would be sure yeah 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 and and I remember thinking oh it's so interesting because I, I have to say that I do lots of strange things but I'm a really skeptical person in terms of I like to understand I like to try things but I like to understand how they work and um, I don't have to know how they work because we know there's lots of things we don't really know but if they work, they work. And I just thought it was, it was so interesting. And I was trying to remember the first horse. I'm trying to remember where I first saw it on pads. And I don't know if it was when you came up here and I'd, otherwise I'd just seen it through. I think um, we talked about it before I came up. What year did I come up? Was that 2015? It was the advanced. Yeah, training. 50. Yeah, maybe 2015. Might, yeah. might've been 2015. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. um, so, I, but I think we had chatted about it before because I showed Linda 
uh, it would have been that spring. Yep, exactly. I think it was that spring. And she was, she, cause I was, I, I, I said to her, you should see this thing that Wendy's doing now. And then it happened that she was in the area and so on. And then, and then she got to see it. Well, that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so Linda came to uh, Warrington, Virginia to do a book uh, talk, right? I can't remember which one of her books was coming out. And um, so she went to the tax shop, um, Hunt Country in town. And so I had started doing Surefoot now for about, I guess, well, I started in May, 2012. So we're coming up on an anniversary. So it was about three years. And so I took my iPad and I went to the lecture. And after Linda got done with her book talk, I said, Linda, I want to show you this. And so I showed her some videos and then she was very intrigued and we got to talking about the fact that on Monday, I think that was like Saturday, on Monday I was going to be working with some horses um, near Manassas. So Linda said, well, can I come out? And she said, sure. So we go to this barn. It's a barn, um, Heather, Heather, uh, oh, I can't pronounce her last name, uh, Heather Scott, I think it is. Um, it was her barn and I was working with some students under saddle and I did a couple of horses and we saw the normal things happen. The horses relax, the stride length increased and all that sort of stuff. And then I said to Heather, I said, do you have a difficult horse? And she said, oh yeah, we have Huey, he's ADD. And you know, like somebody rode him and they, and he bucked him off at the end of a trail ride. So I was like, great, go get Huey. And they brought Huey out into the arena, untacked in a halter. And I did each front foot a couple of times and then I did both front feet and this horse fell over. And I don't know if he fainted or what, but he <laughs> fell over and laid on the ground. I actually have a picture of Huey laying on the ground. And <laughs> I thought I'd kill my first horse with sure, but my heart was <laughs> pounding so hard. And I looked at Linda and she's like, oh, he's breathing. <laughs> <laughs> And she hadn't run over to do ear work. So I'm like, okay, the horse can't be that bad because she's, she hasn't moved. She didn't move, right? And then she's right. pointing out different things about him. And I'm like looking at the horse and looking back at her. And, I, and then she's the, the most incredible question. She said, so Wendy, what's the most interesting thing you've seen with Surefoot? <laughs> and I'm like, besides killing a horse. <laughs> Um, and I told her this story that about a horse that ran like a bat out of hell because we unlocked him at 19, but um, he laid there for like five minutes and then he finally just got up and we took him back to the barn and the, the owner of the horse wasn't there. We never even asked permission to work with this horse. So that was <laughs> so pretty, pretty incredible. But you know, he was fine and I've only ever had that happen with one horse. I hope that never happens again, but um, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it was interesting. And then it was that summer you came up here for the advanced training. And I, and I remember it, it, it was really interesting because um, I, I had only just started using them. And we had a, one of our geldings that we put him on. I remember that all he would do was rest a hind foot on one pad the first time that we, we put him on it. And then um, I, that we offered it because he wasn't willing to stand on on the front feet, it was just like a hind foot. And yet the next, so the next session we had him out being ridden. And this is, I think at that point you weren't doing as much with them when they were on the horses as you are sort of now, it, sort of initially. But what was interesting is we had him on the, we had him on the pads. And he, every time we would ask him to come off, he would come off the pad and come all the way back around and come right back and stand in front of the pads. Yeah. And every time he did that, there was a change in his posture. So there was a release through the head and neck. And, and I think that that is, I think that's so amazing and fantastic the way that when we allow the horses to find their own way, that, that they, they will find it. And so we really, it's about getting out of the way of your horse. And yes. that's not easy for most people to do. No. And, and way back in the beginning, in the very beginning, <laughs> The, so I started in May, and then the end of the month, I flew to, to um, Spokane, Washington, and I uh, worked with a bunch of horses there. And then I flew home and went immediately to Holland. And in Holland, I sat on a horse while someone else put the pads underneath his feet. And that's the first time I felt it. Well, we videoed that footage, and I was on my way to my Feldenkrais training with Mia Siegel and Bud Tolst. And so I, I sat Mia down, I still have the audio of, of her, what she saw, and I had her watch the video. And as she's watching the video, she said, oh, look, there's the change in C6, C7. And then, oh, there's the change in the pelvis. And so wow. she 
narrated all of the changes that happened with the horse that I was sitting on as she watched the video. Wow. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows the connection with Mia, but Mia was Dr. Feldenkrais's assistant for 15 years before he started training people. And Mia is the person Linda took with her to work on the first horse, right? from Northeast yeah. Ohio. Hi, everybody. Hi. So if you just mute your audio for now, that'd be great. Great. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the circles upon circles, but the connections with Linda and Mia and Feldenkrais and, um, you know, back again years later, I think is just uh, something that I find totally fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I was thinking this morning because I was thinking, well, there was a, of a couple of times where I've seen such a huge change in the horses besides the week that you spent up here where we saw some amazing changes and we had a horse actually in holland and i couldn't find any pictures but this was an icelandic who was uh 11 years old had come from had a lot of potential in terms of as a competition horse but he was so stiff in his body and nervous about people and the woman who had him was actually a teach touch practitioner and had done a great job of just getting this dog to uh, this horse to trust people more and so on and so during this uh five-day course we did we had him stand on the pads a little bit every day and he that that just he seemed to be really accepting of the pads and he wanted to stay on for a long time and so i think on day four we had horses under saddle and so we brought him into the arena and let him stand on the uh, the pads with the rider and we had to really ask him and again this was kind of in the early days where we sort of let the horses make the choice to come off but some of them will stand on forever yeah. <laughs> if you kind yeah. of let them and so i kind of asked her to just gently just quietly let him uh, ask him to move off and this is a horse that could not uh trot in an arena around a corner because he was so pacey and he could not absolutely could not canter at all in an arena and so she came we he came off the pads the first time dropped his head walked around just a totally different posture came came back to the pad so we put him on them again let him stand again and he did that three times and the change in this horse he could now trot i mean this is in such a short period of time considering that his muscle memory of of not being able to trot and that sort of that just the habitual response that he had to corners and so on was pretty ingrained and then she, so she went home and she continued with them and this horse would she'd let him stand in his paddock on them and he would stand on them for 30, 40 minutes before wow. he would walk off. And, and she then wrote to me a couple of months later and she said he could now canter in an arena. Wow. He could trot, he, everything was changed. So it, it was a perfect example that you can teach an old dog new tricks, so to speak, yeah. when you change what's happening in the nervous system. Yeah. And you know, that makes me think of another horse that the woman, um, reported that the horse wouldn't even pick up, I think it was the left lead in the field. And we did Surefoot at a two day clinic. And after the first day, the horse was cantering the field on the left lead and would canter under saddle. And it, the, the, not all changes happen that fast. Like nothing works yeah. 100%, right? And I, I need to caveat that. But the, the possibility of change and the speed with which it can happen uh, with Surefoot is that's one of the things that's so mind bending that I've seen horses like you, like that horse, I've seen horses change in, in like minutes and not go back. Um, so I, you know, I'm still, I still want to understand how this is working and I, I'm hoping someday that we'll ha we have some research starting now and I'm hoping someday that actually hook up a horse's brain while they're on sure foot pads and mm -hmm. see what happens in the brain because that to me would be the most fascinating thing is what's recircuiting or rewiring or unwiring or rebooting that makes these changes so rapidly by putting a horse on a pad. I mean, it's just, um, it, it would be, you know, Robin Bernhard did our, did some studies with using uh, T-Touch and use the um, mind mirror biofeedback yes. machines. That, she, she lives out near you. When the, she when does, yeah. And I, I contacted her or I reached out to her once and I didn't hear back, but I'm going to have to reach out to her again. Yeah, because I, I, I think it would be, I'll, I'm going to contact her because I think it would be like once things are, uh, you 
you know, you once can we can it. move again, <laughs> right? Once we can move again, um, then it would be it would be super interesting to just see what's kind of what's going on. Um, you know, even if it's just for that moment. And, and I think it's, I think the difficulty is with so many of these things is there's just like you say, it doesn't work like that all the time, but I think the changes, and I, I was thinking about, we were in, when we were in New Zealand last year. Yeah. And uh, so Wendy was doing some demos at uh, Equidays. Equidays? Oh, that yep, called? Equidays. And, um, and it was so fascinating because people would bring a horse and then say, uh, she'd ask the, you know, go around and see which foot the, the horse could pick up to put on the pad. And um, they would, uh, and then she'd say, I remember with one reining horse, oh, so does your horse have trouble, you know, spinning to this direction? It's like, yeah, how do you know that? And, and of course, it was because of the balance. And that's how, you know, if you explain that. And I think that if we can work with our horses from, with, to start with, with nothing on them and nobody on them and give them those choices and start that we can recognize where they have difficulty in the balance. Let them see where they can have the difficulty in balance so that they have a choice and that they can change what it is that they're doing. But as humans, if we can just recognize that they're not out to get us, you know, they're not doing things intentionally. And I think that the things like the Surefoot really help us see that. And, and I think that that is so beneficial for people and for their horses. Yep. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm just wondering how many people out there uh, that are watching right now have actually used Surefoot. So if you've used Surefoot or are familiar with it at all, just put it in the comments in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions, just go ahead and type it into the chat there because we've got a hundred people on. Wow. Yeah. Um, and if we all unmute our mics, it'll be crazy, but you can just post in the chat and I'll try and keep, um, uh, yep, there's a whole bunch of you out there that have used Surefoot a lot. So this is awesome, and and I'll just keep an eye on the chat. Let's see, I don't have any pads. Yeah. Okay, Masterson method. So um, somebody out there is doing Masterson. In fact, there's a bunch of people that are Masterson method people that use Surefoot, and and it's that's the beauty of it is that you can combine it with uh, just about any technique. Um, so whether it's the teamwork and the T-touch or whether it's like if you're a physio or Masterson or um, wow, you know, it just vets are using it in combination with their chiropractic treatments and acupuncture treatments. Um, and I think one of the places that we tend to, to not use it where it could be a really great benefit is during training. So mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of people want to do it before their training, after their training or at quiet times. But I've literally used Surefoot within a riding lesson. Like I was working with a student for 45 minutes to accomplish a certain task at the canter, which I can't remember what it was now, but I remember that it wasn't happening. And it was a regular student, so I thought we'd done Surefoot with her horse, but we hadn't. So I stopped the lesson and I did Surefoot for five minutes. And then we went back to the task and the horse instantly accomplished it. So, so sometimes it's so hard for us to stop what we're doing to offer a different idea to come back to it and give that horse that little bit of a break and offer a little bit a different feeling but it was so amazing for me to watch the change in that horse when we just took five minutes out of the lesson because you know sometimes you get like really kind of focused on what you're doing and so it's hard to let other ideas come in from the side but that's that is a great place oh trimmers yeah so there's great comments rolling by here yeah um, well, and actually one person was saying that they, they don't, they use them, their horses seem to like them. They don't really know exactly if they're using them, you know, correctly. And I think that's also the beauty is that if you just pay attention to kind of what's going on with your horses, you don't necessarily, you may not be using it for a particular issue, but you often start to see different kinds of changes happening. Like, uh, well, Bob was a perfect example. The, Love the, Bob. Or my neighbor's horse that when Wendy was here, this was a horse off the track. I don't know if you have any video that. Yeah, I have, I have video of him. And I'll, um, so what I'll do is I'll start working really on interesting um, to just show him because one of the things Cassandra said is that, yes, it's taken some, it's, it's taken some time with him, but it was the one thing that was the biggest change in his like this, the biggest shift for him to be able to go forward. And she hasn't really been using, our winter has been horrible. Yeah. Um, but I, I, she, I think as the spring comes that 
she'll be she'll start using them again on a warm up and also when she's when she's riding. And one of the questions, oh, will you be explaining more about how they work? Okay. Yeah, yeah you go for that, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hang on. I got some video. I think this is before. So I'm going to do a little screen share here if I okay. can back over to uh, share screen. Yeah, screen share and then click on the piece you want and then click share on the, there you yep. go. All right. I've got it up. It okay. So, so this was Bob and I'm, I'm pretty, yeah, this is before. So I pulled off the video from my coach's eye yeah. because the, um, the other videos were a bit long. Um, yeah. but this was just Bob before and we did, we worked with him for three days. It was four days total and we worked with him for three of four days. Right. And so yeah. this really high headed, short strided pattern, you know, that was just pretty much how Bob was moving. Um, you can see in the walk, look at how his neck goes up and back, up and back, up and back. So I don't know if my pointer shows up on that, but you can see how he's shortening his back every single stride to move his legs forward. And um, so I'll just advance this a little bit. Oh yeah, there's there when he comes close by. And you see how short strided he is in front given he's a big thoroughbred, he should move really freely. You know, he's built to move well. Let's see if we have, here's some, Oh, still trot. Yeah, the interesting thing about him is he was rushy, but he actually didn't go forward. Right, right. Yeah. It was that and, combination. And, so, and this is his left lead. This was his good lead. His left yeah, lead. He never picked up his right lead in the before video. But no. look at how high his head gets, yeah. you know, and he's just, um, that's, that was Bob. And she'd had him for how long, Robin? Oh, she'd uh she got him the previous november but when she went to pick him up he went over backwards uh in the tra uh, loading the trailer and broke his withers so she had been really carefully kind of going um you know working with him and she's a really nice woman and and is you know just wants to do right by her horse but he had raced for six years and that's a long time of you know you know, racing and the, and the trainer wanted him to go somewhere that he wouldn't be kind of taken advantage of because he, he was not easy when she got him. He was um, and a nice horse, but man, he just lost his cookies and <clears throat> was not easy to handle. Yeah, this was attempting the right lead. Yeah. And um, so just kind of, oh, where, where is he coming by? Oh, yeah, it's actually, oh, this must be the, maybe this isn't the first day. He yeah. actually has his right lead there. Yeah, but he didn't the first day. So this is some part of, of yeah. the thing. Anyway, if you have, then you see the change that happens in him when you put him on, when we put him on the pads. Okay. Uh, all right. So now I have to go. Okay. So when, when I'm screen sharing, so I'm just going to go to the last day. Yeah, yeah. And then do my screen share again. Do, do, do. Screen share. Uh, yeah. Yep. So you could even see from that down transition coming out of the canner. I'll just play. I, I don't know why I don't have more of that canner, but even there, you can well, see. Well, actually, I think that right canter lead was that day because she because of the shirt that she's wearing. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, the right canter lead was, but you could see the change in his neck. Now, of course, he can't hold it because he's got so much muscle memory, but what a difference. In yeah, how, but there, that's uh, where you can see in absolutely. the Absolutely, yeah. And the, one of the things that, like there, he actually yeah. drops his neck, whereas before when he would go past where the gate was, which was just behind me there, he would twist his neck really, really badly and try yeah. to dive out of the gate. And so you can see it's like it's like Robin said it's not completely consistent, but it's there was enough change in just those few days, like there, yeah. right? You can see him start to go back to the old place, but then he reconsiders it, and he's not as committed to that old place. And so I talk a lot about the degree of commitment that, like, oftentimes what you'll see is that before you see a real shift, you see what the horses are less committed to an idea. In other words, they start out super strongly in an idea like this horse raising his head and then he raises it, but it's kind of like, oh, why am I doing that? And then we get the nice let go in the neck where he drops it down. And as Robin said, he, he can't hold it yet because he's been doing that for so many years. 
But the fact that he could begin to find that enough that it started to become the choice that he wanted. Because horses and people were designed to seek ease. And so when we have an opportunity to feel something different, then we can choose. But without a choice, we can't pick it. Yeah. So I'll just well, I, I love one of the Feldenkrais sort of, you know, sort of sayings is his intention was to make the impossible possible, the possible easy, and the easy elegant. And until that first step, and you see there's many more steps of possibility that this horse is showing us before it was really impossible for him. Yeah. So I've got, so, I've got some before and after pictures I wanted to just. And there was a question about, somebody said, if, if my horse has kissing spine, surely it can't help with kissing spine. Have you had experience with any horses with kissing spine, Wendy? So, so with kissing spine, one of the things I ask people is, has it been diagnosed with, with uh, x-rays? I mean, if you take an x-ray of a horse and you clearly see that there's fusion, you know, you're not going to be changing that. But if a horse is, is going into extension in his back the way Bob was and causing pain, but it's not fused, then you have a great chance to make a change. So it's certainly, you know, and worth a try. That's the thing is so much of this stuff is just worth giving it a shot. And even if the horse get, get, just gets more comfortable and is um, able to feel something different. So, you know, here's just, this was a screenshot. This is yeah. day two. We can tell day two because of the black shirt. That was yeah. day one and day three were similar color. One had yeah. stripes, so it gets a little tricky. But, you know, you can see where he let the neck down. And that was the consistent thing. So, you know, the other thing is that it's certainly worth a try because you don't have anything to lose other than a couple of dollars. And if it doesn't work for you, I'm sure you've got another horse or a friend who'd be happy to use your pads. So it's, it's such a possible opportunity. And one of the things that is a, is a benefit that I think is huge is the way the horses start to relate to people in a different way. Mm -hmm. So Robin, I'm sure you've had experiences where the horses suddenly started to um, engage with the person quite differently than the way they did before. Shiner. Yeah. Shiner is our classic example. I was going to say, Shiner who started chasing you around yeah. <laughs> so he could have the, you could have the pads. Shiner's a, a Mustang that came off, was a, is a BLM horse, and uh, he was always really difficult to pick up his feet. And they were well grounded. He was very well grounded, you could say. And, uh, and after the, and we've done leg exercises with him and we could pick them up and do some little leg circles and so on. Um, but it wasn't until we had him on the pads and, and it wasn't easy for him to go on the pads to start with. It, it Can you see the video of Shiner right now? Oh, do you have it? Yeah, I have I have the after. So wait, let me yeah. stop share and then I'll start share again. Yeah. So and he was Wendy had to really kind of figure out which leg he could pick up, and I think that's the interesting thing is it's not about training them to do it or forcing them, it's actually about allowing them to tell you what's easy for them to do. I mean, you can ask, but it's not about you know getting sort of after them to do it, and. Uh, he, after once he realized the surefoots, I don't know if you have any pictures of him. Sam I don't know. This him. is the but after he was, I picked the last day. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just watch the way this horse is moving in the after because then yeah. I'm play the before. Yeah, yeah. He would shorten his neck most of the time. You just keep coming in every yeah. you wanted for it, but you just keep coming in. They give you a little scrap of paper. You carry them around. Somebody is that is that your background sound there? No, no. Okay, somebody's got a background sound of a guy. <laughs> okay. Right, so we can see that Shiner's actually trotting. And this is the thing I wanna point out is that he's actually trotting. Because I'll show the before video here in a minute. Right, okay, so I'm gonna stop that. I have to stop share to get to my other video. And then I have to go over here and I'll go to Shiner day one. That's day three, day two. Shirt, shirts help. Well, and I think the most interesting thing about Shiner is that the next time our farrier came, he noticed immediately that it was so much easier for him to pick up his feet. And even though we hadn't done the surefoots with him since then, he still maintained a, a more ease in terms of being able to pick his feet up for the farrier. Uh, 
oh, Tracy, I don't know if you, oh, yes, she's muted now. Okay. Uh, there was also a question while you're getting that, but we can answer it after about, about saddle fit, that, that there's a, a horse that, a uh, new horse that uh, found my, is U-shaped and full, oh, on the right side and an A line and collapsed on the left. Is there anything specific with the pads? I, I think you've done some things of showing horses. This was this day one. Uh, yeah, she's got the green shirt on. So you watch on, how his you... head and neck moves up and back. Yeah. Let's see if I've got trot on here. But she was wearing that shirt on the last day too. Maybe she uh -oh. was wearing it on two days. It's possible. <laughs> Hang on. That's the fun part. I like it. Yeah. the dates. The dates on them. They don't. It didn't put the creation date of the date when I ah. put it into my computer. So I'm still yeah. struggling to figure out what day, that's day three, day two, this, pretty sure this is day one. Hang on. Just, yeah, she wore the same shirt color. Oh, shame on her. <laughs> there we gave him water. Uh, well, here's a JPEG. Here's a, vid, a picture of how he was standing. So let's show that screen. I mean, that was very typical. And there were two feet that you absolutely couldn't pick up when we started. Yeah. And you can see his expression. He was really quite put upon to be with us. Whereas at the end, he was actually looking forward and trotting toward me, like trying to get to the pads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really changed his attitude. <laughs> but, and he stood on a multitude of pads. I, like, I think you even had him on the, on the um, half rounds, like the the... I have a, my favorite video of Yeah, I think he was on that. Um, so uh, Janet asked whether um, it was, whether Bob, because he raced in one direction, it, I'm, sh I'm sure that was part of it. If you're only always using one lead, then it's, you're gonna be much more habituated to do that and, and, and muscle memory as well. Yeah. And so um, one of the, uh, one person I know, they were doing some saddle fitting and they put a horse on the full physio pad, which is big enough to put two feet on it. And the whole top of the shoulder area widened out mm. because it had been contracted from the muscle tension. And so the question is, do you wanna fit the horse that's got tension at the top of the shoulders? Or do you wanna fit the horse that's let go of the tension at the top of the shoulders? So if you are using Surefoot with saddle fit, I would suggest that you measure twice and measure before you put the horse on the pads and then measure again after they've been on the pads because yeah. there was such a change. This person was, uh, was over in Europe and they were so astounded at the difference in the width after they'd used the surefoot pad. You obviously don't want to trap a horse into being tight. You know, if it's too narrow and you fit them that way, then they're going to be stuck that way. So if you can make a change in terms of the shape of the top of the withers, that would be important to do before you fit the saddle. Yeah. So actually, Wendy, do you want to just do it for the people who don't know, most of them do know about Surefoot, but the ones that have asked is, you know, how do they work? The best, sort of your best guess. Best guess. So yeah. the best guess right now, and I say that because we're, we, um, I've been doing this for eight years. And for eight years, I've watched horses change in as little as uh, not even touching the pad. Oh, I'll find, I'll find that video. I have a great video of a horse. He never even stood on the pad and he had huge changes. And um, I, I, you know, we forget that the foot's a sensory organ and that it really has to report back to the brain and it has to give that horse orientation in space. So if that foot, is not meeting the ground securely, that horse is gonna be guessing about where he is in space, proprioception. It's like you walking down the stairs at night in the dark and you think you're on the last step and you find out there's one more step and you nearly kill yourself because your, or, your body organized for that step to be there. So there's, the, I've, I've talked with Dr. Peters and we did one talk, we did Brain 101 and you can watch that video on my YouTube channel. Um, but you know, we're, we're looking at influencing the brain with a whole bunch of different inputs. We're inputting through neurochemicals. So we see dopamine, that's licking and chewing. There's gotta be some serotonin, um, that's your feel good chemical. And we're influencing all the mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors that are in the foot. So 
the foot has to meet the ground securely for that horse to feel secure. And if they're not, then, you know, they're going to be anxious and nervous. Let me see if this is the video I'm looking for. No, that's not, but I can get my information. Um, and so we're, there's a large piece of just bringing awareness to the horse. You can't change something you're not aware of. And that's such a classic in the Feldenkrais world is that, you know, you've got to know what you're doing before you can do what you want. And so by discovering what you're doing, you become uh, able to make choices. And so it's, it's Robin, help me out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find a video that really helps explain this. Right, um, right. Well, and, and I do think, I think it's that, I think it's that whole thing of, of novelty as part of it too, that anytime, if we want to change a habit of doing something we're doing, we have to do something different. And I think that the thing about the pads is it offers enough novelty. Now, one of the questions someone said is, which pad do you, how do you know what to start with? And um, the, the, last, the last thing that I remember you saying, and what I tend to do is, if you don't know, the firm pads are a, a good starting place if you had like as long as the horse is basically calm. Yeah. So if your horse is nervous or anxious or tends to pull back or is worried about footing, then you would want to start with the hard pad because if you scare them and Robin, you had that experience. Yeah, um, I did. Um, if you scare them, then they're going to be much less likely to um, want to try it again. Yeah. Right? So it's important. I found the video I'm looking for. It's important that the horses uh, aren't forced into doing this and also that they're comfortable. So I've had horses that in four days, I never got them on a pad because yeah. they were too uh, worried about things, but it helped me give the owner a, a way in which to process that experience and how to handle it. And one of the things that was so important is to make the horse feel safe and that I wasn't going to force them into doing something. Yeah. So we had to turn around and make it that I was going to be in between the pad and the horse so he could trust me that I wasn't going to do anything that was going to hurt him. And then I got his curiosity up and then he would start to follow me. And the owner did get him on a pad. She sent me a picture, but it became more about how do you, how do you help a horse that's this worried about something become comfortable. So in that regard, Surefoot became just simply uh, an expression of a problem with a solution that wasn't really about the pads. But if your horse is nervous, anxious, tense, weak, uh, stall rest, that kind of thing, you want to start with hard because it's going to give slowly to heat and pressure. It's not going to have any lateral give. If your horse is basically calm, then starting with green, with firm, that's totally cool. Um, this horse here, I'm going to show, can you see this video? It's of a... Yeah, I, I could see the, yes, yes. Okay. So he, he was a horse down in Costa Rica that was a tope horse, meaning they taught him how to do this, you know, sort of dancing that they call it. And then he was adopted by an owner who had had him for two years, and they had never seen this horse yawn in two years. I'll play it wow. again. And he didn't even stand on the pad. All he did was brush his toe over the surface of the pad and then yawned like crazy. And they were so surprised because they'd never seen him yawn. And this is, again, an N of one. I've only had one horse do this where he didn't even need to stand on the pad to get a change. So yeah. what's going on? That's the question. And the, the simplest answer right now is that we, we think of the foot as something that we have to make sure it's healthy and it's clean and it's well-shaped that we tend not to think about the internal structures of the foot and that what that foot has to do to keep that whole body organized and upright. And so it's gotta be a super responsive to its environment, super responsive to the things it steps on. And some horses, here he is again, he's a, right? He'd been on the firm pad, there's the green pad now, and you can see he can barely keep his eyes open. So we've got these huge chemical releases, neurochemical releases in the brain, but probably the best way to think about it in a lot of cases is it's like resetting the system, like rebooting your computer, because the changes are so uh, profound and can be occur so rapidly um, and be lasting. So I think of it as like the horse is born with a movement pattern and it's stored in his brain, the way he moves. And then, you know, he's 
gets kicked in the field or falls down or has poor saddle fit or maybe somebody didn't do his teeth right. And so then he starts to develop these patterns and they get like habits, just like people. And so, let me get another one. As we form these patterns, that becomes kind of how we meet the world. And Surefoot, in some way that we don't fully understand, gives the horses the chance to change and to reset back to a more uh, original setting, if you will. And it's just, you know, like when I started this uh, eight years ago, I knew from the first moment that it was something really profound because the first horse I timed for 15 seconds, mm. but I had no idea just how profound this was gonna prove to be. Oh, here's a little guy with a rider on board. Um, his name is, I think this is uh, Oreo. And he had terribly um, shod feet. Oh, that's another, I have lots of horses. But that horse, Oreo, we couldn't change his feet. The farrier came and they were supposed to reset his shoes and all they did was tighten the clinches. But by putting him on pads, he suddenly decided that I was okay. And instead of like thinking about biting me when I asked him to step back, he was like, oh, I'm gonna consider that now because you made me feel good. And so there's this huge change in the relationship that we see in addition. Oh, here's, let's see where I put that. I'm into, now you're looking inside my computer here. <laughs> so there's actually a couple of, one of the uh, questions was if your horse sways a lot, but stays on the pads there on the hind feet, should you move them off? So if the horse is swaying a lot, then yes, you want to actually take them off. Um, I'm gonna find the horse that sways more than any other horse, if I can find it quickly. Uh, I'm gonna stop my screen share for a minute while I find it. So we had a horse down in Costa Rica that swayed, and he could sway on any pad and for a very long period of time, but he was used to it. And so it was okay to let him be there longer. But if you're starting out with a horse and they're swaying a lot, you wanna really shorten the duration because you're, they have to think about it's as if you're starting a new exercise program. And if you let them be there too long, you can really make them sore. So you wanna... Um... So just a question, what have you seen, like what kind of, uh, what kind of soreness would, have you seen that is, that you've... Muscle soreness. So in like shown up by being lame or... Um, I um, stiff and, you know, like, like, well, I guess the best example is think about, okay, so you've been sitting around on your couch now for about two weeks and you haven't been able to go out. And so you think, well, I'm going to go out and do my two mile run. Right. And then the two days later, you're like, wow, man, maybe I shouldn't have run right. that far. And it's that same kind of thing it's because we're working the little tiny postural muscle. Right. Right. And so this horse, this is another horse down in Costa Rica. And he's a, like, it's so hard to imagine that this horse is hotter than a firecracker when you ride him. He's wow. such a cool dude, but he's my star performer. And we've got him on three pairs of pads in front and the slants behind. And if I don't take him off, he will not leave. He will wow. stay there. And it's interesting so, how he kind of, what, what breed is this horse? Um, he's a um, criollo. He's when the, the nervous system comes down. Oh, that's my voice. I'll just yeah. And he just hangs out there and like, he'll just stand there and you just start putting pads under his feet and he'll let you put as many pads as you like. And he's so into it, but you know, he sways a lot and he's used to it. So you can let him stay there a little longer, but you wouldn't ever want to start a horse out like this because like I said, it's like you starting a new exercise program. You can wind up really sore. So right. you're always better off. Oh, here's, no, oh, that's just short. Better so off. So Start. somebody's asking what the pads are made of. I, I guess it depends. <laughs> okay. So the materials we use are really high grade. Some of them are medical grade foams. Some of them are in your pro football helmets and they're different types of materials. We went through several thousand foams before we picked the ones that we use. Straight. And um, so I tested them for a year and a half and came up with these to make, come up with really horse durable foams that we're gonna hold up under the weight of a horse. And then at the same time, we're gonna give us the results that we typically are seeing 
So um, there's different, different types of foams because there's different densities. And so there's... And the blue ones are the, are the softest ones, aren't they? Like a human will stand on those and really feel, feel the softness versus some of the other pads. Yep. And uh, this is firm. It's green. And you can see this horse here. He's just really, he's chilling out and he's really letting this whole hip down. So it's not uncommon to see a horse stand with just resting their toe like that. Yeah. And they're just really letting down. And um, somebody posted about sacroiliac. And we see a lot of horses with sacroiliac issues that um, using the pads and using the slants are really helpful. Now with the dogs, we started something called Sure Paws and we're working with dogs. And the nice thing about dogs is they're so much smaller that you can feel the muscles. And we have a therapist over in Australia named Robin, another Robin, mm -hmm. and she'll put the dogs on a slant and she can feel how the psoas muscles let go. Now we can't do that with horses because there's so much mass, but if it's working for dogs like that, I would, Kind of think that we can maybe be seeing those same kind of changes in horses. Yeah. So a couple of questions. One is, how do you decide on multiple pads? It, that's a hard one because it's not really written in stone exactly. Yeah. And so you know what I do is I start obviously with one one pad, right? And um, getting to multiple pads is not a goal. It's just something that um, Felicitas von Neumann Cosell, and I'm hoping to have her on in a Zoom meeting. When, you see how he's got the pelvis? He's oh, that's my voice again. Oh, I've got to mute those. So um, Felicitas, one day she posted a picture and she had horses on, on triple pads and I was like, what is she up to? So I went up to see her and she finds that she gets a lot of uh, change by using multiple pads. Now you can make a horse um, wither high by stacking them in front. And you usually start with the hard, this is the hard pad, the orange. You start with that as your base because it's going to give you the structure that you need. And then you can build up from there. So um, this is really cute. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, so stacking is something that you can get to, but it's not always necessary, in fact, or encouraged in some cases, because in many cases, just a single pad is going to be a lot for a horse so yeah. you know practice and experience that's going to be part of what makes you decide now i'm going to see if i can get over to this little yeah i've got these so pictures. one of the questions too do you start with one or two feet and and generally you start with one foot and then and see how the the horse responds to it i've had a few horses that you could put put one under and they seemed really comfortable and you know when you go to the other foot you know, that, that they, if they just pick it up, that they're saying, yeah, that's great. And other times you might have to do just one foot at a time until you've experimented with what's, um, what's acceptable for the horse. Right. So, uh, you know, horses know we're going to pick up their feet to pick clean them, right? They're used to having that done. So yeah. if a horse doesn't want to lift his foot, to me, that's a signal that I don't want to pat under that foot. And I just start looking for another pat, a foot. Yeah. So this horse, this is a little quarter horse that I had recently and she'd been doing raining, and I just want you to watch how she's moving here in front, right? And oh, I'll get to mute my sound here. And so she came to me for her first time um, uh, last month, and you know she really is designed to move a whole lot better than what we see here. Like she's so short, and you can yeah. see how that right front is really short. It's not even getting to her nose, right? So. We feel, I just filmed her a little bit before because I knew if I didn't, okay, I was going to be unhappy. And you can just see that she's just really hardly bends in the elbow, like that left elbow, you don't really see it bending much. So the knee doesn't lift very high, right? And of course, in the lope, you can see it's really down in front on the forehand, right? And super short strided, and her butt's really high, and she looks really, really downhill. Yeah. Okay. So we started with one foot, right? And what I want you to notice is here's her foot on the pad and where is her shoulder? Well, her feet are really narrow compared to like, if I drop a line from her shoulder, her foot should be over here on her left front and it should be over at the edge of the pad on her right front. So there, that's where the foot should wind up. But you can see how base narrow she is. And we already started to see some changes. And then if we look at her hoof, picture, we can see that this distance and this distance are totally different. So here's our frog. Yeah. See how tight and narrow this is. So the reason I'm pointing this out is, yeah, again, this is her right front and look at how tight that is there. 
over time in the session, this is in one session, right? Now we've got our foot standing on a pad and you can see that it's much more underneath our shoulder, right there it's a little bit narrow, okay? We saw a change in the shape of her foot on the pad as we went through the process. And this is one that I was just really uh, surprised at, right? Again, we can see how that's starting to line up and we can see how the, this foot shape starting to, to change, right? This is the right one, it's still really narrow, but this one's starting to get a little more even, mm. right? Now mm. we can see we've got her on two pads and I just flipped the orange pad over so I had a clear surface, so I wasn't reprinting. Now the orange pad, will, the print will disappear, but right. um, if, you, if you're working right away, you just flip them over, okay? So she's a little bit wider there. She's still not really where she should be. And one of the things that was super interesting, and I'll just kind of scrub this video a little bit, you can see how her chest moves, right? You can see how she's always lower in her pec line here and her sternum is rotated so that her withers are always to the right. And so she's always lower in her chest on the right side than the left side. Yeah. Right? And there it's really obvious. And when she turned her head, you'd see this happen either way. Didn't matter which way she turned her head. Okay, so now this is another print and look at how much more symmetrical we've already gotten. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. In, in the same lesson. In the same lesson within yeah. like 20 minutes. Wow. Yep, and so we, then I added some slants behind, right? So this is a typical, this one you're doing what I call a session where it's basically focusing on just doing sure foot. And she was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So here's a little yeah, video of her. And look at how much lower the neck is. Yeah. And we start oh. to get some elbow movement, right? Exactly. The, the whole shoulder moves completely differently. Different. Yep. And she doesn't look nearly so on the forehand. Right. And I need to throw some of this video into Coach's eye and see if I can't do the side by side stuff. Yeah. This was just filmed with my iPhone. Uh, so the question is, why the choice of the slants for the hind feet? Oh, I love the slants behind. I, I, I want to, I just give them full foot support, but yeah. heel high. And I personally think that it gives them some lower back relief. I have, I have no proof of that right now. But when we have people stand on the slants heel high, they feel relief in their back. Yeah. So I actually think that that may be going on. And I have no way to prove it at this point. All right, so now I stacked her on that right front. I double stacked her because she was so much lower. And we can still see, yeah, see how that changes there in the chest? Now this side is low, the left side's low and the right wow. side's high, right? And she turned her head and dropped down instead of before when she turned her head right, she went low right. So she, now that's a big change. Okay, let's see, here she's stacked again. Yeah, again, you can see she turns her head right, but she goes low left instead of low right. Wow. And um, I, don't, I didn't show you a before film. Now look at this footprint. Wow. <laughs> I know. That's what was so crazy. And this is the right front. And look at how much wider this has gotten now. Right? It's crazy. I mean, it's really it's crazy. <laughs> then I worked with the rider a bit because she was bracing. Right. So, you know, that's, you know, some people ask me, well, will it stick? You still have to look at the saddle, the horse and the rider, you know, you right. can't take it into isolation, but now look at how she's standing so much wider. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yes. You can use the pads with shoes on. That was one of the questions. Yes. Shoes and boots. It doesn't matter yeah. if the horse is wearing boots. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's, what's interesting too, is when you've got this horse that's low in front, it's going to create more bracing in the rider full stop because they're kind of fighting that downhill push. So then you change the horse. So you have to give the rider that also that possibility of what they can do to, a, you know, to change, to adapt to this new feeling. Cause the horse looks so different. Yep. And, um, and and that this whole letting the whole neck down like this, yeah. that's really going to help let the back come up. Yeah. So this is all I used was hard pads here pretty much, right? Except for that one time I stacked with the firm. And here's our, I'll just rotate this, right? 
she she's moved off a little bit, but you can still see how much more symmetrical these feet are. Right. And she had um was she barefoot? No, she I can't remember. No, she had shoes on. Yeah. So that's the oh. thing is it does it's like those kind of changes can happen anytime. And it's got to be because we're changing the weight distribution. So the hard pad just gives to heat and pressure, but it somehow I think normalizes the pressure in the foot and allows the foot to respond. Yeah. yeah. And you know what I find so interesting that I've seen over and over again too is how horses to start with will have a, a preference of turning their head one direction or the other. And you see them start to explore this changing the head sort of right to left. And uh, yeah. I think that uh, can make such a difference. I had uh, somebody was asking me about a young horse that was having trouble when they're mounting her, she's standing over a mounting block and, and turning her head left, turning right, she can take food eating over, but turning left, she really gets unbalanced. And so I suggested that she, that she actually look and see what she's like with the surefoots to see how she can, if she can pick up that foot, on the left front as easily and then start to be able to turn her head without a rider because if it's that being a detective if they can't do things without a rider without a saddle free in the pasture highly unlikely they're going to be able to start doing them when there is is somebody on their backs yeah so somebody um, somebody asked um where is it uh can you is there a wrong combo and so you know i'm always just asking the horse i'm experimenting and i'm offering them different choices and if they don't want it They'll kick it away. They'll push it out. They'll step off. They'll, they'll just reject it. And so yep. it's our job to, to always say, would you like this? And then if they reject it, it's like, okay, so, all right, you didn't want that, but maybe something else. So it's yep. kind of like, you know, if you go to the store and somebody says, you know, what, what flavor ice cream would you like? And you're going to sit there and go, well, can I have a sample? <laughs> yeah. You know, can I try the raspberry? Can I try the black currant? You know, can I try the different flavors? And then this is the one I like. But another day you might come in and decide you want a different flavor ice cream because yeah. you want to be adventurous or you just want vanilla. You just <laughs> want vanilla. So it's a lot like that. Um, it says, I don't, somebody says I don't have any slants. Um, and the but horses it is create it. Yeah, that how many times the horses will create a slant. They'll step off the edge of the pad and yeah. that's my indication that they want a slant. Um, and it's also like with the back feet, a lot of them will kind of kick the pad to the back foot or when they walk away, they'll step on it with the back foot. And that's really my indication that, yeah, I'm ready for a back foot. I, I typically start with left front because horses are more commonly handled on the left and the front feet are safer. Mm -hmm. And most of the time I'm working with horses I don't know. So, you know, I'm not gonna run to the back end. <laughs> Right. Exactly. I don't know your horse. And I find a lot of horses have trouble balancing when someone picks up their back foot and they'll want to tense their back foot or pull it up. But when they start to realize you're going to put a pad underneath their foot, they get easier and easier with picking up the back feet. And believe me, your farrier is going to appreciate you if your horse is easy to pick up his feet. Absolutely. So another question is, do, um, do you use slants do they want slants when they're downhill? It can happen. I mean, that's the thing is, that just like you were talking about the ice cream, where it's it's it, it's just it's so different. It's like I'm actually wearing a body wrap right now, and I one of the things that I've been sitting on this computer a long time, so my shoulders have gotten really tight, and and so I use different wraps. And and my feeling when I first started sort of playing with the wraps with people is. I think what it does is it helps to reset proprioception. And I think that's yeah. exactly one of the things that happens with the pads. There's just that, there's that little shift that happens uh, through the nervous system. And the thing is, it's going to be different with different people and different horses. Yeah. So we can't say that when we do exactly the same thing with any being, it's going to always act in the same way. Yeah. And, you know, that's the good part and the bad part. Like, of course, uh, it, of course it's, you just have to be able to trust and that's where you know observing is having people become more uh, you know better, better observers. Observers. Yeah. i'm actually going to st um, start doing some uh, videos to help people be better observers and right. and the other thing is so many people worry about doing it wrong yeah the only way you can do sure foot wrong is if you force the horse to stand on it and you have your foot your hand down by the horse's foot yeah those are the only two things that are wrong because right. i'm very concerned about safety and i always want people to keep their hands away from the hoof. If the horse gets unsteady and steps off and your hand's there, that's bad. Yes, exactly. Making them stand on a pad is also bad. It's really about a choice. Yeah. So, so we're about at the end of our time, Robin. Yeah. 
um, this has been awesome. And, and I've got um, three other Zoom meetings this week. I have um, Sharon Wilsey as a guest on Wednesday. I have Daisy Bicking as a guest. She's uh, Integrative Hoof Care. Um, Sharon Wilsey is the author of Horse Speak. And then I'm gonna be doing an intro to Surefoot on Friday where I'm just gonna walk people through the process itself. Okay. So um, those other ones are by, uh, you have to register for the courses. I sent out an email and I'll post on Facebook how you can register. Um, and this video will be available once I process it and, um, and get it up on my site. Well, and, and you have lots of videos on your, on your website, I think too, about different mm -hmm. things. Yep. Um, and, and Judy's question about the horse with tight ha hamstrings that pushes into the, into the bucket on the wall, just try it. That's the yeah. whole thing is you, we don't know. It's only from people experimenting with it, doing things and then having, um, and then reporting back. It's the same as with teach us. The only reason we knew it worked is because other people would use it and find out, you know, what happened. So, yeah. Uh, and you know, now Surefoot's it's literally around the world and it's yeah. in all disciplines and, uh, everything from top competitors down to just just somebody with their horse in their backyard that wants to make them feel better. So, um, thank you, Robin. This hey, is thanks, a pleasure. Wendy. It worked out great, and thanks everybody for joining. And until next time, um, and you know, enjoy your horse either virtually or if you can go out and spend time with it. Thanks, Wendy. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye.